Good morning, church. I'm so proud of you. You came to church on New Year's Eve. Way to go. So awesome. Hey, um, did you have a good Christmas? Would you tell me otherwise? I don't know. Hey, I'm so glad uh, that you're here. I'm glad to be here. Uh, man, there, there's a lot of people sick right now. Have you, have you noticed that? I was just, so you know, I was praying during worship for everyone who's sick. So I just want you to experience the healing uh, power of God uh, today. Um, I know it's already been uh, talked about, but I just have to jump on board and say how excited I am uh, for next week. In fact, I'm excited for the next several weeks. The next several weeks you are not going to want to miss, and I don't think you should ever miss, but the next several are especially exciting. Uh, next week we have the, the baptisms, three baptisms. What a, what a way to kick off the year, right? What a, what a great way. And uh, if, I don't know if you remember our last baptism, but we announced our new baptism wall. It's right out this hall right here where we're having everyone who's baptized put their name on the wall. And it's just way for us to remember uh, what God's doing in people's lives. And so I'm really excited about that. And then uh, how many of you have been here for a six-minute sermon Sunday? Any of y'all six-minute sermons? So the second Sunday of the year, that's the 14th, is going to be, that's a tradition for us. We've done it, I don't know, eight eight, nine years, something like that, a long time now. Uh, but that Sunday is going to be our six-minute sermons. And we, have, we, have, we always have a great lineup, but we have a great lineup again. Uh, uh, Eric and uh, Brittany and my father-in-law and Amber and Richard and Pastor Andrew. It's, it's just going to be a phenomenal week. You're not going to want to miss that. It's always a ton, uh, a ton of fun. Now, today is a bit of a unique Sunday in that it is the last Sunday of the year, the last Sunday, like the, the last day, not just the last Sunday, the last day of the year. Now, tonight, uh, how many of you tonight are going to, uh, to a, a watch party or a New Year's Eve party or something? Anyone? Anyone? I know we're having, we're doing one here, a bunch of you are coming, but um, it, true, so truthful, how many of you are planning to stay up until midnight? Anyone? Anyone? All of the people under 20. Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> When you're, when you're in your 20s, you're like, I can't wait to see what happens. When you get over 20, you realize what happens is it just 1201. It just happens. Nothing mad. By the way, do y'all remember Y2K? Like, what a weird thing that was, right? Um, nothing happened. Probably nothing will happen tonight, but... Um, tonight, so it's, a, it's, it's New Year's Eve, it's Sunday, it's the last day, it's New Year's Eve. Um, I'm not planning on staying up, I've, I've done it before, I've, I've been there, I know. I don't think there's anything magical uh, about New Year's Eve, but I will say this, I, I do think that, that this is, uh, these moments in time, that it's a great chance for us to remember to evaluate and to adjust, to remember, kind of look back and, you know, what worked this year, what didn't work, you know, uh, to, to evaluate those things, to make, you know, some, some adjustments. And so I, I just want to ask you kind of two rhetorical questions that kind of get you thinking uh, this morning and, and, and get you going this direction. Two, two questions. The first one is this, is what are you going to leave behind? As we go into a new year, as we go into, you know, something new, what are you going to leave behind? Now, I'm starting with that because a whole bunch of people will be making New Year's resolutions, okay? Now, I'm just curious. We know Pastor Jace is not a New Year's resolution guy. How many of you are New, new Year's resolutions people? Anyone? Anyone? You're embarrassed to say it because Jace said he's not. And so you're like, I don't want to oppose, right? Um, uh, what, we, we put a lot of focus on you know, what we're going to do different. But I'll say this. Often to do something different, it starts with stopping something that you've been doing, right? With leaving something behind. Or maybe, maybe 2023 was painful for you. You need to leave some pain there. Maybe something bad happened. You need, so, so I just, I, I've been thinking the last week or so, like, what am I going to leave behind as I step into this new year? And then the second question is, what are you dreaming towards, right? So, so you start letting go and you start looking ahead. And I just want you to think about these questions today because I think we have an opportunity as we end one year 
we start another. Tomorrow is a new day in a new week in a new year. Like, how cool is that, right? The, the first, Monday, the first, 2024. And I believe today that the Spirit of God is going to ask us what I believe is a prophetic question for each of our lives for 2024. Uh, I, I, I'll show you this question. It's in Mark's gospel, but I'll just tell you, I had a completely different message. Uh, I was almost completely finished with it. And, uh, and late this week, I was driving across town. I was mulling it over. I was praying in my spirit. I was thinking about it. And all of a sudden, I mean, just out of nowhere, and I love when this happens, I felt like the Holy Spirit just dropped this prophetic question into my heart. And I knew instantly, I text Lisa, and I'm like, everything's about to change for Sunday. I believe that the Spirit of God is about to ask us a prophetic question that's going to set us up for what he wants to do in 2024. We read this question in Mark chapter 10. I want to read it together. Uh, this question in Mark 10 is asked by Jesus to a guy named Bartimaeus. Okay, So I just want to read the account, Mark 10, 46. Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him, told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped. Don't you love when Jesus stops? <laughs> And he said, call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. And throwing his cloak aside, he jumped up to his feet and he came to Jesus. Here's the question. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. I want to ask you to do something. This is a tradition for us. We do it every single week. We have this moment as we get into God's word where at Harvest we believe that God's word is it's living and it's active. In other words, it's not just an old book. It's unlike any other book. Every time you open it, open it, the spirit of God breathes on it and it comes fresh into our lives for exactly where we are and exactly what we need. But I found in my own life that if I'm not positioned in a way to receive what God wants to do, that it just becomes another book, another story. I just kind of, and I miss, I miss what God's wanting to do. So we have a tradition here where we just pause in this moment. We say it's about a 20 second prayer and the prayer goes something like this. I'm going to ask you to do it it's in your own way. You just say, God, I'm opening your word and I'm opening my heart. Will you talk to me today. And what's fun about this is every week, without fail, it always happens, is that God has a word for all of us, but he also has a word for you individually. And I think that every one of us need a word to hang on to as we step into the new year. So how many of you will pray that prayer with me? Will you do that with me? All right, so let's just pray right now. Jesus, we're so thankful for you, for your, for your presence here today. We don't ever, ever uh, take it lightly that when we gather that you are here with us. We value your word. And so we take a moment and we just pause. We get our hearts ready to receive. We ask you today, God, will you speak to me today? In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. amen. Have you ever been told this? Be careful what you ask for. Have you ever have you been told that? Be careful what you ask for. There, there was a woman who went to a doctor's office. She was going to be seen by one of the new young doctors. And, and the doctor um, asked what he could do for her, but demanded that she needed an immediate cure. Okay? She was like, well, here's my issue, but you have to take care of it. I'm, I'm done with this. So they spent about four minutes in the exam room, and suddenly the, the woman just burst out of the room screaming and yelling and running down the hall. So one of the older, more experienced doctors stopped her and, and pulled her aside and just making sure that everything was okay. And the woman told this doctor what had happened. The older doctor marched down the hall, went into the room where the young doctor was there and began to scold the young doctor. said, what is wrong with you? Miss Terry is 63 years old. She has four grown children, seven grandchildren. Why in the world would you tell her she's pregnant? 
The young doctor looked at the old doctor and said, well, does she still have the hiccups? <laughs> I haven't told a cheesy joke in a while. Just wanted to help you this morning. Be careful what you ask for. Be careful what you ask for. This moment in Mark chapter 10 with Bart, I'm just going to call him Bart for short. Is that okay, Bart? Um, this moment is an astounding moment. Jesus, the Son of God, comes to Bart and asks him this question, what do you want me to do for you? If you're taking notes today or, or maybe you, just, you have your phone, you can use your note app, I, I would love for you to write this question down. What do you want me to do for you? But I don't want you to think of it in terms of Jesus asking Bart. I want you to think of it as Jesus asking you this morning, what do you want me to do for you? I'll ask you this way, um, friend, what do you want Jesus to do for you for your family, for your kids, for your grandkids, for your job, for your finances, for your purpose, for your health, for your, what do you want Jesus to do for you in 2024? This is the question that as I was driving across Paseo earlier this week, I sensed that the Holy Spirit was dropping into my heart for you this morning. I believe it's a prophetic question for us to wrestle with today. I, I just believe that today is a day for us to set our expectations. I, I think today is a day for us to, to ask big things of God. I think today is a day that we walk away from some things that have maybe held us back in the past. I think today is a day that we dream towards some new things that, 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 that you, you can barely imagine them. That's why they're a dream, right? You can barely you know, even see. like they're, they're just outside the realm of possibility, but, but today is the day that your spirit begins to awaken that maybe God is up to something. Today, I'm hoping to convince you that God has your best interest in mind and that he's actually asking you today, what do you want me to do for you? How did Bart get to this moment with Jesus? If we go back to the story, it starts real innocent like this. It, it starts like this. Then they came to Jericho. That's how this story starts. Then they came to Jericho. This is a seemingly insignificant part of the story, uh, but I've learned not to blow past the details uh, that are in our scriptures. And, 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 and so you got to go back. In the verses prior to this, we see Jesus with his disciples. And actually in verse 32, so you go back a, a little bit. In verse 32, it says this. It says they were on their way to Jericho. Jerusalem. Okay, so the passage previous, they're in Jerusalem, but this passage begins like this. Then they came to Jericho. So between verses 32 and verse 46, Jesus moves from one location to another. And in other words, this story happens at a transition point. It's a transition. And now you need to know that the distance from Jerusalem to Jericho is about 18 miles. A person who, who maybe was walking, uh, which would have been the most likely mode of transportation from Jerusalem to Jericho, they would have come down in elevation from about 2,500 feet to about 825 feet below sea level. The, the topography would have changed from this semi-arid you know, uh, climate to a total barren, parched land landscape. In other words, there's, there's an actual physical change in the, in the setting. That there, Jesus goes from one place to another. Bart is in one location. Jesus is in another location. But all of a sudden, the two intersect at a transition moment. And it was interesting as I, I, I read this really simple sentence that they were they, they were entering Jericho, and I realized this is a transition moment, and I realized that today is a transition day. <laughs> Today, we're, we're transitioning from one year to another. We're, 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 we're moving from one place to another. And, 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 I, and I just realized that, that this, these transition moments are exciting moments. Transition moments I believe, help us become aware that change is possible. <laughs> 
Like it's all of a sudden, you're one place and your life intersects with something else and all of a sudden your heart awakens to the possibilities that maybe I don't have to stay where I was. Maybe it doesn't have to stay like it was. Maybe something new is possible. Now, now one of the most exciting things to me about the God that we serve uh, lies in this word. You might have heard it, but I'll just, I'll just tell you about it really quick, quickly. It's this word, omnipresent, omnipresent. We, we believe uh, in a God who is omnipresent. Now, omnipresent, it just, it just means this, present in all places at all times, okay? Um, parents, do you sometimes wish when you're raising your kids that you could be omnipresent, right? Especially, you know, especially if you have multiple children, right? I, I remember, you know, as the kids, when the kids were young, you know, when they're really young, you just put them in little baby jails, you know, of cribs and, and, and play pins and, and things like that. And, and so you know where they are, you know, you just, you can keep up with them, you know, or you go out in public, you put them on those little, those little leashes, you know, that, that you see, yeah, like, like they're fairly easy to keep up with, Right? But then they grow up and, and they want autonomy and they start moving about and they start getting friends and they start getting rides and they start getting driver's license and we still track them, okay? But all of a sudden, you kind of like as a parent, you're like, ah, ah. Like I remember the first day that Mercy left to drive herself and her sisters to school and we watched her, you know, leave the driveway and I just was like, ah. Oh my gosh, I cannot protect her. I can't watch over. And, and, you know, and, and there's, just, there's just this moment, right? We're like, I, wish, I just kind of wish I could be all the places at all the times just to make sure everything is going okay. Omnipresent, being present in all places at all times. Now, in Bart's story in the New Testament, Jesus is a human. Come, he's God incarnate in human form. He can only be in one place. He's in Jerusalem then he's in Jericho, 18 miles over, right? He's in one place, and then he's in another place. But all that changed, if you keep reading the gospel, when one day Jesus goes to the cross, he's crucified on that cross for your sins and for my sins, and they bury him in a tomb, and his body lays there for three days, but three days later, he's risen from the dead, and he ascends into heaven, to be at the right hand of the Father. And now, something changed. Now, God is omnipresent. Now, God is able to be with you and with me and with you, with you, with you, with you, with you. All of a sudden, he's able to be there. And I just want to say this because some of you will relate to it, that you might not have felt like God was present in your 2023. You might have felt like, where did God go when this terrible thing happened to me? Did God get busy? <laughs> did he get distracted? Does he not love me? Does he not care? Because if this is true, if God is omnipresent, he can be at all places, at all times. I just, I haven't, I haven't sensed him in 20 23, and I, and I just feel like that, that here at this transition moment, 23 to 24, you know, one year to the next, to a new year, to a new week, to a new day, that this transition moment could help you to become aware that not only was God with you in your 2023, but he's waiting for you at this transition, and he's hoping that you'll become aware of his omnipresence. He came to Jericho, it says, as Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city. A blind man, Bartimaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. So now enters a primary character in the story. His name is Bartimaeus. Now, almost every translation, I don't know which one you read or which one you're following in, but almost every translation refers to Bart by his blindness, okay? Almost every single one. Uh, the New Living says, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus. The English Standard says, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar. Uh, the King James and the New King James both say, blind 
Bartimaeus. The New American Standard says, a beggar who is blind named Bartimaeus. I, I went through a whole bunch of them, right? Almost every single one, almost every single one, they referred to him not just as Bart, but as blind Bart. Have you ever known someone who was known for something in such a way that people used it to describe them, right? Like it became a part of who they are, right? Now, now there's some innocent, you know, descriptors like, like I knew a guy named, named John and he was big and so everyone called him Big John, right? Like that one kind of makes sense, right? Uh, if you look at my phone right now, uh, Lisa in my phone is Sweet Lee, okay? Sweet Lee, because she's the sweetest person on the planet, in my opinion. So, so I, like, 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 that's a good descriptor. I'm not talking about Big John or Sweet Lee. I'm talking about when, you, when you're describing someone and you say, you know, and you put their name in there, and the person's like, who? And you go, you know, he's always the drunk one. You, 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 know, you know her, she's the mean one, right? You, you, know, you know he's the gossip. You know her, she's the one no one trusts. He's the liar, right? She always this, he never that. I'm talking about when all of a sudden descriptive words become identity words. This is Bart, because the scriptures literally record, they, they could have just said Bartimaeus was sitting there waiting on Jesus, but he had a reputation in the community. He was known as blind Bart. <laughs> Can you imagine? Like, like just for a second, think of your worst, you know, attribute, whatever that is, you know, and just imagine that around the water cooler at work, that's how people talk about you. They know your name, but they've added a descriptor to define you. All of a sudden, that is who you are. The problem is, once we allow these words to define us, they're so much harder to overcome. Now, now I, I didn't say they're impossible to overcome. I just said they're harder to overcome. But I want to remind you on, on this transition Sunday as we move from one year to another that you don't have to be identified by the things of your past. You know, I started out and I asked you a question, what are you going to leave behind in 2023? There's some things we need to leave behind. You, at this transition moment, can decide I'm not going to be identified that way anymore. And I need you to know that I believe that it doesn't matter how long you've been there or how strong it is or how often you've been called that or any of those things. I think that Bart's story has a thread of hope for you and your family today. So Bart is, enters the scene. Watch what happens next. When he heard, everyone say heard. When he heard that Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I wanted you to, to make sure, I wanted to see that you saw, I wanted to see that you saw that Bart heard. Is that confusing enough? I wanted, you, I wanted to make sure you saw that Bart heard. Now, now I know like you're probably already ahead of me, okay? But, but, but Bart couldn't see, right? because he's blind Bart, so he had to hear, right? Now, the reason I think this is important is because in my experience, most people focus on what they don't have. Wouldn't it have been easy for Bart to miss Jesus simply on the fact that he can't see? He couldn't see Jesus, and he could have sat there and in his corner and, and griped and complained and whined and, 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 and said, well, I, I can't see. I'm just, I'm just going to miss it. I'm, just, I, I'm not able to see. I, I, I don't see it. Do, 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 I can't see. Do you know I can't see? I can't see. I'm not, I'm not able to. And, I mean, isn't that the rhetoric? Is we, we find the thing that we don't have and that becomes our focus. If, if only I had more money. If only I was married. If only I could have kids, if only I was taller, if, if only, you know, if only this, if only that. And what I love about Bart's story is he heard, 
He didn't let the one thing that could have stopped him stopped him. He didn't worry about what he didn't have. Instead, he focused on what he did have, so he couldn't see Jesus, so instead he heard Jesus. And as you're contemplating, what do you want me to do for you from Jesus, I would love for you to ask another question, just rhetorically, what do you have? Isn't it easier to start a list of what we don't have? Isn't it? I mean, we just had Christmas, and we got all these new things, and, and still, still, for some of us, our list still includes things we didn't get. Still, it includes things we don't have yet. And I would love for you, as you're contemplating this transition moment from year to year, to think about what is it that I have in my life right now that God could use? What is it that, 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 that here is here right now that, that would, would indicate that maybe God is up to something? Bart heard that Jesus was there. He cried out for help. He cried out, right? Son of David, have mercy on me. So church, I want to I wanna ask you to, uh, to join me and Lisa the beginning of this year to cry out for the Lord and for his mercy. I, I, just, I, I just love how Bart is sitting there and he hears that Jesus is coming and his response is just to cry out, to, to ask the Lord for help. Next week, we're going to start the first series of the year. Uh, uh, most of the time at Harvest, I, I, I tend to preach in series. If you're not familiar with that, it, it just th- you can think of it as like a theme. Uh, I'll, I'll pray and ask the Lord. I, I feel like it, there's a theme, and we're going to spend some amount of time on that theme and allow God and his word to help us. And, and I'm really excited about our theme this year. Uh, uh, Lisa and I were, were away at a conference several months ago, and, and as in a work time, I felt like the Lord gave me a, a theme for 2024. And so next week, we're kicking off our first, you know, theme of the year. And, and it's this. I'm so excited. It's just this. Jesus over everything. Jesus over everything. So what a great way to, to put Jesus over everything than to just cry out for his help. I'd love to ask you, would you give Jesus the first seven days of the year? Now, now, honestly, I want you to give him every day of the year. But I'm just going to start asking you the first seven. Would you give him the first seven? And, and I'm going to ask you to do it in a really specific way. And I'll tell you up front that I don't even like this way. Is it okay for me to tell you that? That I don't like this way? There are some spiritual disciplines that are more fun than others. Have you found that to be true? Like, I love worship. Worship is fun, right? It's exciting. There's instruments and clapping, and I get to shout and make up words to songs because I don't know them, right? Like, it's, worship is fun, right? Can I tell you a spiritual discipline that is not fun? Fasting. What a terrible idea. Am I right? <laughs> is, that, is it okay for me to say that? Fasting's hard, but it's so beneficial, and so I want to ask you, this is how we're going to cry out to the Lord for help. I'm going to ask you to join Lisa and I the first seven days of the year to actively put Jesus over everything, everything in your life, in our church, in our city, through fasting. Now, I know that I didn't give you any warning, but here's the problem. If I had given you a warning, you would have gorged yourself this week to get ready, and then we would have had other issues, all right? You probably do that anyway. It was Christmas, right? We just, Lisa and I were talking, and we're like, what a unique opportunity that we get to worship together on the 31st, and then on Monday the 1st, we, we turn the calendar, and we have, we have six days, and then we come back together on the seventh day. And so, so we thought, what, what, if we, what if we just asked our friends at Harvest to just fast with us? If you don't know what fasting is, it's a voluntary denial to self in order to create a spiritual hunger. It's not complicated. You, you choose to give up something and you replace that time and energy with a seeking of God. 
So what happens is this, is most people will fast food. In the, in, in, not fast food. They will stop eating food. Some of you are like, I'm, I'm in with this. I can do a fast food weak diet. Let's do it. Chick-fil-A every day. What happens is this, is um, most of us don't realize how much we eat until we stop eating. <laughs> Most of us don't realize the rhythms that are in our lives until we disrupt them, right? And so what happens is we stop for a defined season. In this case, it's seven days. And all of a sudden, when it comes to the meal time, and this will happen to you, especially days one, two, three, you will naturally, whatever your habit is, you will get up, you will go to your pantry, you'll be halfway through pouring a bowl of cereal, and then you'll remember, wait a second, I decided to fast. And that is a critical moment, because in that moment, here's what we do, is we realize I have decided to starve myself from something and to replace it with this intentional seeking. So we pour the cereal back in the box. We put it back in the pantry. It'll still be good. It's only seven days. And then we take that time. And listen, we're not going to get religious about this. Five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever it is for you. And we use that time to seek the Lord. And we say, you know what, God, for the first part of the year, I'm doing this because I want you to be over everything in my life. You're what's most important. I want to set the course of my year. I want to, I want to start off in the right way. And what will happen is the seeking happens. Is you'll, you'll, you'll start out, most of you, most of because we're, we're all selfish, you'll start out seeking things that are on the top of your heart, which most of us, the top of our heart is ourselves and our stuff, our job, our family, our questions, our things. But what will happen if you'll pursue this, if you'll go, it's just seven days, if you'll go for it, is that you'll realize that you pretty, pretty quickly burn through what's at the top of your heart and you're forced to dig a little bit deeper and you'll start you'll start seeking God over everything for for things going on at harvest you'll start seeking things uh, Jesus over everything and things in our city you'll start seeking Jesus over everything for things you'll read the news and instead of being frustrated you'll be drawn to come to the Lord in prayer all all of us I'm just telling you what will happen is it will recalibrate your heart for 2024. It's like, a, it's like flushing the system, right? Most of us don't know. Now, here's what's amazing. Most of us don't know what's built up in our hearts in 2023. Most of us also don't know what's actually built up in our gut in 2023. <laughs> See, Jesus was smart when he asked us to fast. He's helping you physically and spiritually. Isn't that amazing? So I would just love for you, and we're not going to get like, again, we're not going to get, you know, religious about this. If you follow Harvest on social media, we're going to post some corporate, you know, prayer focuses that might help you. I, I think Lisa and I might, might do some videos this week to encourage you and to, to help you. And so let me just break, let me break it down like this. How, how do we do this? Th- three really easy steps. Number one, pick something to fast and how you're going to fast it, Okay. So pick it. Just pick, like, I'm going to fast one meal a day. I'm going to fast two meals a day. I'm going to fast everything but water. Um, Please drink water, okay? Whatever it is. Like, I'm not telling you how to do it. Pick something to fast. How are you going to do it? Number two, use that time to pray. And then here's my favorite part. Number three, get ready. I've never had a fast that something supernatural didn't happen in my life. I'm just telling you. Get ready. Now, also get ready because some of you will have caffeine headaches because you'll realize, wow, I didn't realize how much caffeine I was consuming, right? Get ready because some of you will be shorter with your kids or with your spouse, and so there's going to have to be some extra grace in the home, right? Get, Get ready. But what I really mean is this, is get ready for what God is going to do in your life. Get ready. How many of you are in with me? Anyone? Yes. Let's do it. This is what Bart did. He called out to the Lord. Verse 48, many rebuked him. They told him to be quiet. I love Bart. He shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. People made fun of Bart. They discouraged him. They, they, they didn't believe the same things that he believed. But I just want you to see this. I want you to see that Bart seized the moment. He seized the moment. 
depart knew that Jesus was close, and that caused him to push even harder. And I'm just, I'm asking you at this transition moment to just press in. That, that's why I felt like I needed to ask you, like, like we could have skipped the whole fasting part and just had an altar call today and had the worship team behind us and got excited and be like, we're going to press in today. But there, I'm just telling you, there's some moments that require us to get uncomfortable, to take a step, to do something different. I just, I call it seizing the moment. Because when Bart sees the moment, Jesus took notice. It says in the next verse, Jesus stopped and he said, call Bart to me. They called the blind man. I love there. They didn't even say his name there. They're still identifying. Call the blind man. Cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. Throwing the cloak aside, he jumped up and he came to Jesus. And can I just tell you, this is exactly what happens when we pursue Jesus is that he also comes closer to us. Isn't that cool? I, I love this verse in James chapter 4, verse 8, that says this. It says, come near to God, and he will come near to you. What a promise. Like, what a promise that God, I mean, think if anybody had the right to stand off at a distance and say, you come to me, it's God. But God says this, if you will come towards me, I will come towards you. I, I don't know about you, that's the kind of God I can get behind. Like, that's the kind of God I can get excited about. Like, I take a step and he takes a step. He's God. He doesn't owe me a step. He comes closer to me. And so what I, what I fully believe is going to happen we're going to have a New Year's party tonight. We're going to eat tacos. We're not going to stay up till midnight. We're going to get up tomorrow. It's going to be a new year, a new day. We're going to make a decision. God, I'm seeking you. I'm coming after you. I'm putting you first. I'm, I'm putting you over everything in my life. And we're going to do some intentional things. We're going to fast something. We're going to do that. And all of a sudden, I'm just telling you what's going to happen. You're going to get over the caffeine headache. And then you're going to realize God is coming closer to you. And then you're going to come closer to him and he's going to come closer to you. And you're going to come closer to him, and he's going to come closer to you. I'm just telling you, this is what happens. And then we finally come to this remarkable question. Verse 51, Jesus asks, what do you want me to do for you? This is Jesus asking a human, what do you want me to do for you? Now, I want you to put yourself in Bart's shoes for just a moment. How would you answer this question? How would you answer this question? Well, Jesus, I know you're reading it. It's hard, for, it's hard for us to imagine ourselves in that moment. Jesus is asking you, what do you want me to do for you? Now, now I read this, and, 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 and at first thought, I'm like, come on, Jesus. Kind of an obvious question, right? He's blind Bart, right? He's, I mean, not just like, we're, we know. We know what Bart's issue is. We know, like, this is an obvious question. But then I realized this, is that if Jesus were to ask you and I today, not only is it an obvious question, but every single one of us have an obvious response. Every one of us. If God asked you today, what do you want me to do for you? There are some things at the top of your heart. There's things you've been praying for. There's things you've been believing for. There's been things you've been, you've been pressing in, you've been questioning, you've been struggling, you've, you've been wondering, you've been, you've, been, you, you've been pursuing, you've been wanting. Every one of us has an obvious response. Can, can, can I just ask you today, isn't there something that you would like for God to do for you today? Isn't there something that you've been praying about, you've been asking, you've been believing for? In fact, I, I would love for you, uh, I, I'm, I'm assuming you're taking notes, you've already written down the question, what do you want Jesus to do for you? I would love for you today, and even in the coming days, to, to take some time and actually write it down. These are the things that I'm believing, that I'm asking Jesus to do in my life today, this week, this year, in the next seven days, I'd love for you to bring those things to the Lord. As I was writing this, I realized that some people, because of your theological beliefs, you might be offended that God would ask a human what you want. And so I just, I just want to answer this because I, 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 think it might, I think it might help. You know, I will sometimes, I, I probably don't do it often enough. Lisa's behind me. She can shake her head yes or no. But sometimes I come to Lisa and I say, babe, how can I help you? 
She, she's, I don't want to know how she's nodding. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes, sometimes. I'll come to her and I'm like, hey, babe, what can I do to help you in the kitchen? What can I do? You know, is there anything I can do? What, what, in other words, like what can I do for you, right? Sometimes I'll, I'll come to the girls, right? I'll, I'll notice that, you know, they're stressed about something. They got a, a big homework assignment and things going on. I go, hey, 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 what can I do? How can I help? What, 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 can, I do? what can I do for you, right? And, and the reason I'm pointing that out is, is simply this is that we ask this question, what can I do for you? When we love someone, when we're in relationship with them, and when we want the best for them. Am I right? We ask someone, what can I do for you? When we love them, when we're in relationship with them. In other words, it's not just a, you know, a, 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 an, a, an obligation, but like we're doing life. We're, we're together. We're in relationship. And when I want the best for them. And as I thought about that, I thought, because I, I, I did, I wrestled with Jesus, asked Bart, what do you want me to do for you? And I was like, wow, that's amazing. And then I realized we ask this because we love someone and we're in relationship with them. We want the best for them. And I thought, this is why Jesus asked this question. Because this, this is the Jesus that I have surrendered my life to. He's not a far off God. He's a God who loves me. But by the way, one of the things that is astounding about the love of God is that he doesn't wait until you get your act together. Which by the way, I don't think we ever do. <laughs> he doesn't wait until you get some things fixed. He comes to you while you are still a sinner. And he says, hey, messy thing, I love you. This is, this is a God I can give my life to. He loves us. He's not standing off a long way. He wants relationship with us. He wants to, he wants to know... Like, he wants to know about your day. I remember early in our marriage, I would come home. Lisa, I grew up in a, I have one brother, and just, this is just our, this is just our culture. I just, I didn't learn to communicate till I was married. And uh, Lisa go, how was your day? And I go, good. She just look at me. And I'm like, I answered your question. <laughs> she had to teach me that she wanted more than a one-word answer. She can train any of your, no, I'm teasing. <laughs> can I just tell you that, that God wants a relationship with you? I, I, don't, I don't think he's offended by petty, short, non-relational prayers, but I think he wants more. Like, I think he's excited that you're going to make a decision to spend the next seven days really intentionally talking to him. Because what's going to happen is in about three minutes, you're going to run out of things to say. And you're going to have to dig deeper. And it's going to become a conversation, not, not, a one, not a list, but a conversation. Because Jesus loves you. He wants a relationship for you. And lastly, he wants the best for you. Did you know that? He wants the best for you. This is my theme verse of my life. John chapter 10, verse 10. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I, Jesus, have come that you may have life and life to the full. I'm just telling you, this is a Jesus that I can put all my hope in. A God who loves me, who's in relationship, who, who, who wants the best for me. And I would love for you to know that same Jesus if you don't already. I'd love for you to know him. i got to get to the end of the story because the worship team's playing. The blind man said, here's the end. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, Jesus said. The, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and he followed Jesus along the road. Why don't you stand with me?
I almost titled this message, More Than You Bargained For. And here's why. Jesus asked this question, what do you want me to do for you? Bart says, I want to see. Jesus heals him, which, which I don't, I don't want to blow past it, but he, he received the miracle by faith. And, and I just need you to know that you're a people of faith. And as you fast and you pray and you seek and all these things, that, that faith is going to be required. It's going to require, it's going to, it's going to require you to, to believe some things as if they, they actually were, even though you can't see them with your eyes. It's just, faith is just, it's just part of the equation. But, but I want you to notice, because this is a theme that I see in Jesus' life, is this, is that when we ask Jesus for something, he always gives us more. Always. More than you bargained for. Jesus didn't just heal Bart's vision, but he gave him a whole new life. Immediately, he received his sight. That's what he asked for. Remember? I want to see. Immediately, he received his sight. But, but I noticed it says, and immediately he followed Jesus. He got more than he bargained for. He didn't just receive the healing, but in an instant, God gave him so much more than he ever, he ever could have imagined. He, Bart's life was transformed. All of a sudden, he becomes a disciple of Jesus. I'm going to follow in your ways. I'm going to go where you tell me to go. I'm going to do what you tell me to do. I'm going to give my life to you. And I've said this a whole bunch. I hope you don't ever get tired of hearing it. But I just believe that following Jesus is the most fun, the most adventurous, the most courageous. It's the, bad, it's the best decision I think any of us can ever make. And Bart, he, he started in that moment the most exciting part of his life. I'm sure he was excited to be healed in his vision. But I think if you go 10 years down the road and go, Bart, what's the best part of your life? I don't even know that getting his sight would have made the top 10 list. Because all of a sudden, I think he would have begun to tell you, you know, 10 years ago, God did this. I started following him, and then he started teaching me things, and I started going here and doing this, and he called me to something, and boom. And all of a sudden, you would have realized Bart is a completely different person than he used to be. I mean, isn't that what the gospel is supposed to do as we come into contact with the life-changing story of Jesus? So here's what we're going to do. I asked you some questions today, and... I did it in that way because I'm trying to set you up for this week of seeking the Lord, and I think God's going to do some things. But I, I, I want to I w- I spend the last moment. Worship team's going to lead us in a final song. I, I want to spend these last moments mulling over this question that I believe Jesus is asking each and every one of us today. What do you want me to do for you? At this transition moment, as we're getting ready to step into a new year, what is it that you want me to do for you? And some of you are still wrestling with, really, would God ask me that question? He loves you. He wants to be in relationship with you. He wants the best for you. So yes, I think he wants to know what he can do in your life. And I'm going to come back up. We're going to close in a prayer. We're going to ask God. We're going to literally take whatever your list is, and we're going to submit it to the Lord and say, hey, God, here's what I'm asking you to do in my life in 2024. And then I'm just telling you, you got to get ready. Because it's going to be a wild ride in 2024. Are you ready for that? Our worship team, help me. Let's worship for just a minute.